speak in English for to, to bring back my 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 language of my PhD. Well, my name is João Carvalho. I'm a PhD in politics. I do research on migration since my master's. Uh, it was about Portuguese migration uh, policy. Then I did my PhD in Sheffield, uh, where I studied uh, the far right impact on immigration policy in Britain, France, and Italy. It was published by Rutledge, my my model, uh, my PhD thesis. Since then, I kept covering uh, the UK, France, and Portugal. I extended as well my research to Spain a little bit. And I dropped a bit of Italy because I cannot follow up all, all of the political developments in Italy. So this book chapter, basically, it was an invitation by the editors of uh, Oxford and Books of Portuguese Politics and Society. The editors are Jorge Fernandes, Pedro Magalhães, and Antonio Costa Pinto, who invited me to write a review of Portuguese immigration and immigration history. And, well, it was quite a task. Why? Because while we have 50 years of immigration, it's, it goes against 500 years of immigration. So we will have a lot to tackle and to cover here in this presentation, since we pretend to address the two of them, the two topics. And uh, to start off, uh, let me say, uh, mainly, uh, I learned a lot of, as well with this, uh, this chapter, because I used to work mostly on immigration and not on immigration. But it's very funny because I always thought the two link, the, there was a linkage between these two social phenomena. I think in Portugal, they can be seen as the two sides of the same coin. And I'll tell you why in, in minutes. Uh, I hope you have questions for the end because you can't stop me <laughs> from speaking in, the, in Zoom. And uh, well, so I'll start by sharing my screen. Let's see the amount of success I have. And now put it on full screen. Yes, display settings, get out of here. Okay, so it's fine. We managed to overcome technical difficulties that were observed just five minutes ago, and we can progress. So, as I tell you, I'm working in the CS Ishka since I got uh, almost when I got back to Portugal, since I'm in 2013, it's almost now 10 years. And uh, basically, the book chapter proceeds by there is a lot of literature review. I had to. I had ben benefited a lot from the research developed by the Observatory of Immigration uh, about immigration. And um, the part on immigration is a literature review that is well, very much drawn on my own work. And um, uh, apart, despite being a literature review, there are some original bits in this presentation. One that I never tested and I never developed so far, but I found through this work. The second is more or less already published. That is the data about the politicization of immigration. That is an article that I published with Mariana Duarte on Journal of Common Market Studies that you can access on my website or, or through the journal website. So moving on, since we have a lot to cover. The summary will be, we'll, have, uh, we'll review the four waves of immigration into Portugal since the 15th century against the three waves of immigration into Portugal that are registered in the literature. We can discuss at the end if there is a fourth wave developing at the moment in Portugal, but that's not really into the literature or it wasn't the, the objective of the book chapter when I started to write through, it was, it was written during the COVID, so I was, a pleasant time. Politics and politicization of immigration, it's what I want to address at the end of this presentation. And basically, what are the patterns of immigration from Portugal? It's what we're going to look for in the first part. What are the main drivers? Then how we're going to see how did immigration into Portugal evolved? And one of the questions that I want to address is what factors help to understand 
the net migration into Portugal in the last 20 years. So starting by emigration. Emigration, Portugal has a long history of emigration. It starts in the 15th century with the discover, so-called discoveries. Uh, Portugal, the Portuguese empire one needed to colonize the new territories and that in, to attain that objective, we had to export some of its mainland population into the out, uh, into the other, into the colonial areas. And therefore, this was the first my big migration movement, mainly as developed um, between uh, 980 and 50, between 1850 and 1930, there was uh, around 2 million uh, Portuguese were already settled abroad, mainly into the colonies, mostly into Brazil. That was the main center attracting Portuguese immigrants at the time. Most of these immigrants were more, uh, from rural areas and unskilled workers that uh, that in, to improve their lives and their condition of life, decided to emigrate into the colonies. At this time, the remittances of the immigrant population was very important to the economy. It accounted for half of the, the trade balance, 50% of all Portuguese exports. So it was a big, a big um, financial contribution from, for the emigrant, from the immigrants into the mainland. And this process then stopped and decelerated with the First World War. In the periods in between First World War and Second World War, there is a kind of deceleration of, of migration because there is this instability and uh, as well the cost, there is economic crisis of, 1980, of 1928 that has strong repercussions that leads into, that are still observed until the Second World War. So, the second stage, the second wave of migration of Portuguese migration starts after the Second World War. And uh, in this period, uh, there are new destination countries. Portuguese immigration starts to diversify. No longer, the colonies are no longer the epicenter of all this immigration movement. Europe, the US and Canada become new centers of new destination countries. Uh, what is important to account is that to, with uh, the, the, the reconstruction process at, in Europe, uh, especially in France, uh, there is a high demand for uh, men skill, for manpower, for workers to reconstruct the countries that were destroyed through the war. Initially, this process was in France, initially this process was uh, responded by Italians and Spaniards and Portuguese as well from emigrants from Northern Africa. And uh, in the seventies, Portuguese emigration to France is very big and they are, it's very much um, renowned in France. The conditions I had uh, to say, the conditions of the Portuguese em the emigration process was not in uh, conditions very favorable for the emigrants in part because the, the fascist regime imposed barriers on immigration. So you could not, it wasn't free to emigrate for all. There wasn't freedom to leave the country. And uh, what happened was the borders were closed only with permissions you could pass the borders. And at least one quarter of the Portuguese outflows contain an irregular status. This is quite, quite a high proportion. And I wanted to add a small movie, a small trailer to show you movie in French called The Jump or Salt that you can find on YouTube. And the movie shows is made in the late 60s. And it shows basically the movement of the immigration process of the Portuguese from, main, from Portugal to France. How oh, they jumped the borders and jumped irregularly. And you can see the, um, the similarities between the migration process in the late 60s with some that happened in the mid 2010s, I'm referring to the to the so-called asylum crisis, where the immigrants, as well, most of them on the images, walked, basically walked and got some public transports and trust private transports to move from Syria or border countries to Syria into Europe. 
So it was very, it's very similar the process. And um, as well, what happened was the Portuguese in France, their settlement occurred in not favorable conditions. They would settle in the bidonvilles that were shanty towns constructed by the Portuguese immigrants to accommodate them for the first for the first months when they arrived when they arrived on um, on France at, in France. At this time, one point million Portuguese nationals emigrated to three different continents. So if before Second World War emigration was concentrated into the colonies, we see the diversification. As well, it happens that the fascist regime realized that it could no longer contain emigration, nor could redirect migration just to the colonies. So he ended up making, allowing regularizing emigration in the late 60s and to fulfill agreements, uh, immigration agreements with France, Germany, and other countries to improve the conditions of uh, the integration conditions of Portuguese in the countries, and as well, the interest of the fascist regime to allow the remittances to flow, flow, flow freely into Portugal. That was one main interest. So that was the pattern of um, emigration of Portugal until the revolution. The 1974 revolution. And let's see if we move on. Okay. If I'm right, I didn't jump one. Yes. Third wave of immigration from Portugal developed in context after the, the revolution. What happens is that the boom, the construction boom, and the great economic boom of the, the golden period, the golden age of Europe. It uh, declines, the economic growth declines. There are the so-called the oil shocks and most European countries start imposing restrictions to emigration. And uh, Portugal was affected by, this, by these restrictions and uh, the Switzerland became the, became the main destination of Portuguese emigrants in, in detriment of France that until then was the main destination. Switzerland needed manpower, and the Portuguese start since faced the, they faced too many difficulties to enter France. In advantage, considering the advantageous position they had in Switzerland, they they diverted their inflows to Switzerland. Again, inflows at this time were unskilled, mainly from rural areas, and from the late 1970s to the to the 1990s. An annual average of 20 to 30,000 immigrants left Portugal on an annual basis. And at this time, the Portuguese democratic regime well, accepted that immigration was part of the democratic way of life. And it uh, recognized the political rights of Portuguese immigrants abroad. So they created two electoral circles so immigrants can vote to the Portuguese assembly, National Assembly. They are also entitled to vote, believe, to Portuguese uh, presidential elections. And uh, alongside with this recognition, there was uh, created the community uh, community of the let me check of uh, Council of Immigration uh, Council of Portuguese Communities that was established until 1986. Which was with the purpose of what? Strengthening the linkages between the immigrant community and Portuguese mainland. Because it was recognized that during the fascist regime, the immigrants were, were invisible, and they were a big significant contribution to the economy, but in political terms, they were invisible. Well, what happens remarkably, what happens in Portugal? in democratic life is that immigration through the 90s, 1990s and 2000s becomes invisible in, politi in political discourse. As we see, in, um, immigration never stops in Portugal. The only flu the, um, there are fluctuations on its intensity, as we'll see next. And But it never ceases. It's a social phenomenon that is permanent in Portuguese society. Nevertheless, the Portuguese political elites stopped referring to emigration. The Council of uh, Portuguese Communities is closed and only reopened in 1996. Why? Because speaking about uh, emigration for Portugal is speaking of, is recognizing that there are problems in Portugal that enace 
uh, the outflows of Portuguese citizens. There must be economic reasons that uh, motivate Portuguese citizens to go abroad. And this movement, this social phenomenon, then clashed with the idea and the narrative that Portugal was converging with the core of the European core. We will become like Germany in 10 years, or we were converging with Germany, but Germany doesn't have an immigration rate, so why? So to say that immigrants become invisible, it's, a, it's part of the daily life of Portuguese families, but in the political discourse, it's not very visible. So we move on to the fourth wave of immigration. The fourth wave of immigration uh, starts in the 2000s. There is the diversification of destination countries and UK becomes the main destiny, which, which is remarkable considering that France and Switzerland until then and been the main European destinations of, of the Portuguese immigration. And uh, remarkably as well, there is a revival as a, as a piece by uh, Claudia Pereira uh, have noticed. Remarkably, there is a revival of the North-South Corridor driven by the outflows to Angola, Mozambique, and Brazil, which is remarkable in the sense that when most outflows, most immigration migration flows are from the South to the North, Portugal at this time was remarkable because many of Portuguese immigrants uh, would emigrate to the South, Southern countries, which considering the um, the difference in terms of human development wouldn't be so reasonable. But considering that there was economic boom in these countries, and this economic boom generated demand for skilled and semi-skilled workers, then the Portuguese immigrants to, Im to improve their, their, their life conditions, they would move to Angola and Mozambique with happiness to get better wages and get a better, better standard of life than they were obtaining in Portugal. And uh, what is funny as well in this, um, in this uh, US and Canada continue to become, Brazil is as well one destination, one very important destination, but as well, Canada and the United States are important destinations. Spain became one as well through the 2000s, which until then we didn't have much immigrant, uh, immigration flows into, the into Spain to our nearby country. And so what happens is there is another diversification of the destination countries of Portuguese immigration. I remember that the 2000s is a, a time, the early 2000s is the time of economic growth. And academic research estimates that uh, much as much larger estimates than the estimates provided by INEP. And what it says, it points out that between 2001 and 2005, there was an annual, an annual average of 58,000 departures. And in the late, uh, seven, late 2000s, with the economic crisis of 2008, it expanded to 79,000 individuals. What I want to recall here is that these departures are Portuguese citizens that um, are in a working uh, age. They are active in the economy. They are not retired. And therefore, this impact on the labor market when we have an annual, annual departure of 60,000 workers, active workers, this, this creates an, um, um, a demand for workers in the domestic labor market, as we'll see. So looking on the immigration rates, is that in the, the outflows between 2000 and 2018, what we see here is that uh, the outflows were considerable. This is the DNS provided DNS statistics. So the estimates are lower than the ones that I spoke that are made by academics, like the Observatory of Immigration. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that total immigration jumps from the 2010s onwards, as there is this economic crisis in Portugal from 2000. There is the worldwide financial crisis of 2008. And in, by 2011, Portugal is affected by the sovereign debt crisis, like Spain, Greece, and then, uh, Ireland, perhaps. Therefore, then what we see is the, the intensification of immigration to levels that are, the, these levels are bigger than the 60s, 
perhaps they are the highest levels that we've registered, I mean, that we have records of emigration, that we have years that there are more than 100,000 Portuguese living, 100,000 100, active workers living the Portuguese labor market, which leads to the fourth, continuing to the fourth wave of immigration. With the 2011 sovereign debt crisis, the Portuguese coalition government, I say, opted again for the exportation of the oversupply of labor in the context of higher rates of unemployment. At this time, Portuguese members of the Portuguese government came saying that against the invisibility of, em of emigration through the last two decades, suddenly they came up saying, emigration is a good thing. If you don't have a job in Portugal, emigrate abroad. Uh, being a pro Portuguese professor abroad is great. There can be too many, so much uh, employments. We cannot create enough jobs in Portugal, so emigration is a solution. And this, well, Portuguese have followed the advice as we see in the statistics, and the rates of Portuguese emigration in the early 2010 surpassed the outflow observed in the 60s, or the outflows that we observed in the 80s and in the 90s. So finally, 50 years after the Portuguese revolution, when emigration was perhaps never so intense in Portuguese recent history. Well, one important thing as well to, to, to highlight is that in the media, it was reported that Portuguese emigration was, became very much uh, very skilled. It was composed of skilled workers and the skilled workers, the lack of skilled workers in Portugal would have an impact. But in, in reality, the proportion of skilled workers is still a minority of the outflows. Well, what happens is that the proportion of Portuguese people with undergraduates and higher education has increased, and this reflects on the outflows as well. Therefore, the proportion of Portuguese immigrants with higher education also increased. In the same proportion, there was an increase in the overall society. But there is no disproportion. There are not more uh, highly skilled Portuguese living than low, low skilled. And Portuguese emigration continues to be very much a low skilled, uh, very much main form by low skilled Portuguese workers. Why? Because first, Portuguese education system still generates a lot of um, people with no, who don't finish uh, normal education, basic education, the uh, nine, 12 years of uh, high school. Uh, by, and this, general, this means that these workers will be unskilled and their job opportunities in Portugal will be very diminished. Therefore, if you want to have increase your life prospectus, you need to emigrate. So this gen, Portugal structurally generates a lot of a big proportion of unskilled workers and these unskilled workers will need to emigrate. And another, another important uh, characteristic of these outflows of the fourth wave of emigration is that the profile of the Portuguese immigrants and their skills varies according to the destination countries. Meaning what? Meaning that low-skilled workers go to other immigration countries where the migration networks are very well established for example, France or Switzerland. In France, a recent study, not a recent study, but a study conducted in the mid-2010 concluded that Portuguese immigrants were only more unskilled than the Turkish. So they were the second most unskilled community in uh, immigrant community in France. And so, so in opposition, countries like the UK, uh, get to see a lot uh, of more skilled workers to emigrate there. For example, as well, there is this mm, very known movement of Portuguese nurses uh, into to the UK, where the UK companies come to recruit directly into Portugal, just in, this, in the nursery schools. And so to provide job contracts, so they finish school, they will emigrate directly into the UK. But not only, there is as well the case that those who emigrate nowadays to the United States have, have higher skills than the average. And um, other countries, probably like Austria, Australia, uh, where there are skills um, point system and where 
to Portugal for immigrants to be allowed to emigrate, they should prove to have the necessary skills. And so what happens is that the immigrants, Portuguese immigrants who go to these countries will necessarily be more skilled than the ones that emigrate to France. So a summary more or less of the immigration into the immigration into Portugal. As uh, Maria Vaganha wrote, immigration is the most valuable export commodity made in Portugal. I believe this is the case still. We don't estimate, but I think it would become the contribution of Volkswagen uh, uh, it's, uh, because immigration persists in Portugal. Recent studies published by the Observatory have uh, highlighted that uh, there were 60,000 Portuguese who emigrated abroad last year. And that number might increase with the current inflation and the current uh, price crisis that there is in Portugal. There might be there might be an increase of immigration in next year and in the following years. In the compare in the comparative per perspective, Portugal is was the EU member state with the second highest rate of immigration as proportion of its population. And what, what I think this reflects, it reflects a country that we has high levels of social inequality coupled with diminished levels of social mobility. So what happens, if, I believe, what happens in Portugal, we, have, we aren't a rich country, but the gap between poor and rich is very significant. And uh, those at the bottom will have very few opportunities to improve their life conditions in Portugal. So in, in order to improve their, their life conditions, mo many of them will emigrate and go abroad. As we see, this is not only the pattern, of, the, the pattern of Portuguese citizens. It happens a lot of many new Portuguese citizens that were immigrants and naturalized Portuguese will follow the same pattern. Meaning, if they stay in Portugal in, this bottom, in the bottom of the labor market, their social mobility opportunities will be very diminished and to improve their life prospects, they look abroad. So exactly what I say in the bottom line, I believe that this high rate of immigration reflects the Portuguese economic underdevelopment. We are in the semi-periphery semi of, um, of the European economy and the characteristics of Portuguese society enables this social this this social phenomenon. Let me just say one last thing about immigration that I always compare Portugal to Ireland. Well, doesn't Portugal doesn't have the immigration rates of Ireland, where they calculated that in a family of 10, eight or seven would emigrate. But what happens is that immigration was uh, pointed out and highlighted as as a problem in Ireland, and one of the main objectives of the human development policy or even the economic policy of Ireland was to reduce reduce immigration by true by to attain this objective they had to make a change in their economy and to make it attractive to the, the citizens to stay in the country and they've been successful to a certain extent we can discuss I'm not a very deep expert on uh, Ireland but I always found that this political objective, to be to have some, it could be feasible in Portugal. So moving into Portuguese after five centuries of Portuguese immigration, we only have 50 years of Portuguese immigration to cover or immigration into Portugal to cover. So it's easier. Foreign population, what happens is the foreign population in Portugal before the revolution was very diminished. According to studies, it increased from 32,000 individuals to 58,000 individuals in between 75 and 1980, according to an article of Beatriz Padilla. Mainly, I believe the my big majority of these could be Europeans. We don't know. I didn't have access to their to their to nationalities. Well, immigration only starts to be observed from non-EU immigration starts to be observed in the late 80s, from the late 80s onwards. Why? Fed up. By supported by the, um, the investment that was generated by the structural funding provided by the EU. Uh, Portugal becomes the EU member state in the mid 80s and starts receiving uh, structural funding for construction, construction projects. 
And it's at this time that uh, the CCB is created and another um, the highway is the right uh, network of highway starts being created. And this generated uh, this generated the demand for manpower for unskilled workers at the time that the immigration was still significant, not as significant as we'll see in 2000s. But then what happened was this manpower, this demand for manpower would be appeased by flow, outflow, inflows, people coming from uh, the Portuguese speak, uh, African speaking countries. And this would be mainly Cape Verde and Angola. And so the, these people, the, the movement, because we were part of the EU, we established a closed border. So labor visas were very difficult to issue. People would come with tourist visas and then overstay, or they would come to, to visit a familiar and then they would overstay. And they would happen that they would overstay with the irregular status. At this time, uh, shanty towns started to appear around the Lisbon area. It's a, it's a, a time that the shanty towns that we've seen in France have now moved into Portugal. And uh, uh, in the 93 regularization program, Portugal, uh, through, due to pressure, mainly pressure from the Catholic Church and its organizations, they were pressured to regularize the Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese, the African immigrants in Portugal that didn't have regular status. And so far, the, the government from uh, center right, the PSD, led by Prime Minister Cavaco Silva, uh, deployed the first regularization program that led to the to 30, 39 and 166 requests. And those requests, 72% of those requests were made by immigrants origin in Palop countries. And so to say that mainly at this time, three quarters of, of the immigrant flows were, were from the Portuguese former colonies. But this tendency will decrease over time, despite not being really, as we'll see next, it wasn't the diversification of the origins of immigrants wasn't expected by the Portuguese elites, as we'll see next. But in three years, because the regularization program wasn't completely successful, and because the inflows continue of immigrants coming from African countries to work in construction. And for example, we have the 98 uh, Expo 98 uh, the exposition that generated a big, a big demand for manpower. And one year before, there is another second regularization program, and 35,000 residence permits were issued. But the proportion of Palop citizens decre declined to 64%, which, apart from being a, a eight points, just an eight points de decline, what it highlighted would be the diversification of the origin of Portuguese immigrants. But at the time, Portuguese political elites thought that. Well, immigration into Portugal would only come from Portuguese speaking countries. Mm -hmm. So first wave of immigration leads to the second. The second wave of immigration is totally unexpected in Portugal in the sense that the origin of immigrants was totally unexpected. The intensity of the inflows were unexpected and the Portuguese uh, government was caught by surprise. What happened that was in 1998, there is a new immigration law and the immigration law allows people to make a, a regularization request once in Portugal if they find employment. And there was such a boom, such a construction boom that the lack of manpower was used by labor networks from Eastern Europe to what? To divert the, their migrants, their, their citizens who emigrate abroad. And they said, well, there is, a, there is an intense boom in Portugal that divert the flows into Portugal. So in 2000, the Portuguese authorities had, I believe, 40,000 requests for regularization of immigrants from Ukraine, Moldova, origins that they never expected and they never, they never, they never expected to see in Portugal. The Portuguese border police uh, registered their movement through the border. They would come in vans, not big not big buses, but in vans, small vans of transport vans. 
And the border police itself could not explain the process. And the process was simple, was that there were already international labor networks established in immigrant countries like Ukraine, that in face of the opportunity to emigrate into Portugal and the, and the easiness to obtain a regularization of the, of the status, they diverted their flows into Portugal. So, supported by these, by the intense the labor demand, there are plenty of immigrants who come into Portugal, and the Portuguese government is uh, in just five years after making, or four years after making the last regularization process, leads another, opens a new regularization process that is the most, the biggest one, the most intense, that uh, leads to 180, 30,000 individuals to obtain the regularization of their status. It's important to notice that the Portuguese elites were a bit divided about these outflows, so they didn't provide residence permits. They provided authorization permits for a maximum of five years that they would be suppressed afterwards. But basically, there is a clear, clear linkage between the intensity of influence and the boom in construction and public works. We have one interior minister saying in the in the news, in the in the printed news, that well, you all know if we were more what we if we increased inspections and control in the work sites, most of the work of the public works would stop. So therefore we want this to provide manpower so the economy can flow. And it's what I call the client politics model. That is the regulation of, um, of immigrants is basically dictated by the labor market. Third wave of migration, and we see the second and third wave of migration, there was already a high proportion of, of Brazilians, of Brazilians in the second wave of migration. And the third wave is mainly formed by, by, by Brazilians. There is the Lula Agreement that was signed in 2003. And there is another partial regularization program, but they were very ineffective due to these agreements in the government, in the government coalition. It was a coalition between PSD and CDS. And CDS didn't uh, was not keen on this client politics model that was accepted by, by PSD. This led that uh, the regularization programs didn't lead to were not as effective as the past. In uh, in face of this problem, the 2007 immigration law granted uh, allows again for a regular immigrant that settles in Portugal and has a job contract to apply for regularization, and this this permission this this mechanism granted uh, 53,000 residence authorizations to irregular migrants mostly to Brazilian immigrants. What happens is that the outflow, the inflows of immigrants since then have declined and they are now going up, as we can see, in, by, we'll discuss at the end of this presentation. But if we look into the, um, to the net migration with this, it was very positive in the 2000s, in, until 2003, 2002, let's say, Meaning what? The number of inflows was well above the outflows. And what I create, what I say is that this, you know, the intensity of inflows is explained by the economic boom and the outflows of Portuguese workers. But with the, since 2004, there is the economic stagnation of Portugal and net migration starts moderately decline. And with the economic crisis after 2008 and 2010, it happens that uh, it really declined completely and it becomes negative. As it was reported in other, in other, in other uh, articles, Portuguese net migration through this period is only similar to Eastern European countries, meaning that immigrants are coming to Portugal and the outflows are, or they come very less, very few of immigrants come into Portugal and a lot of Portuguese immigrants flee. And here is where the piece of the original bit of this chapter is that looking on this, uh, on this figure, I found out that there might be a relationship, though I'm not a very statistical, highly statistical guy. I can see a, a small relationship that when unemployment rates go high, means what? Inflows decrease and outflows are overwhelming. 
And this is, means what? That the labor market dictates very much the pace of the migration flows into Portugal, at least in this period. And when the economy is booming, immigration still persists, but the immigrant flows are very intense. When the eco economy declines and we get economic recession, unemployment rates go high, the number of immigrants in the country decreases, and the number of Portuguese outflowing the country intensifies a lot. So that's that's what I believe explains a bit of the outflows and the inflows is basically the labor market and this semi-peripheral position of Portuguese economy in the world economy. Looking into the politics, as I'm already speaking for a long time, <laughs> policies and politics of immigration in Portugal. Well, in Portugal, it's remarkable that there is inter-party mm -hmm. consensus between the two governing parties that uh, was reached over the regulation of irregular inflows through a backdoor approach. And there is the, the second policy is granting preferential treatment to, to Portuguese, for, for to immigrants from Portuguese speaking countries. This is first seen why, because as I said, the the migration laws in Portugal are usually approved by the two main parties, and they contain they they include this mechanism for regularization of immigrants according to labor market demand. So if the labor if there is labor market demand, the immigrants can access the labor market and have proof of a job contract and make deductions into the to the social security, and secondly. There was this preferential treatment to often immigrants that it was observed. I forgot to tell that the 96, 96 uh, regularization program had a preferential treatment treatment for people who was from Portuguese immigrant, uh, uh, Portuguese speaking countries. And as well, the Lula agreement in 2003 expressed the preferential treatment to the Brazilian citizens in detriment of other nationalities. But uh, Portuguese uh, elites, Portuguese political elites have adopted, uh, I believe, since mid 2000s, a multi full multicultural paradigm that in terms of integration policy was to provide equal chances to all immigrants independently of their origin. And this was reflected in the 2000 uh, nationality law, the reform of the 2006 nationality law that ended the preferential treatment. and. I believe that multicultural uh, paradigm is also reflected in integration policy. And now Portugal is uh, is classified in second place by MIPEX due to regulations, the favorable regulations that we have to the integration of immigrants. At least in theory, they exist. If they are fully implemented, that's another question. In terms of politics, I believe there is a laissez-faire approach that was adopted in the early 2000s due to the construction boom. I believe there can be another less fair approach nowadays in this, what I call the fourth wave of immigration, that in this context of uh, low unemployment in Portugal and uh, in the context of economic growth, the Portuguese political elites basically regulate the inflows according to the labor market demand. There is no policy to privilege uh, skilled workers over unskilled workers or, or, or some origins over other origins. Uh, there are now more efforts to organize the outflows from the origin countries, but until then, until until the late, the late 2010s, uh, 2010s, Portugal didn't manage to to channel the flows from the origin countries through legal through legal channels. There are efforts to make this now. I don't know how successful they're going to be because it doesn't depend only on the Portuguese government. So I spoke about this inter-party consensus regarding the provision of favorable conditions for foreign citizens to settle in national territory. I have an article about uh, comparing, the, comparing the Portuguese nationality laws with Spain, with Spain. And what on that article I want to express is that being center-left, it wasn't enough to Spain produce a reform similar to Portugal. In fact, Spain maintains the nationality law of the 90s or before the 90s, and which is which is not as multicultural as ours, and it has a lot of preferential treatments that we have abandoned, fortunately, in two thousand and six. 
So to show you the last slide will be the levels of politicization, politicization of immigration in Portugal. As you probably already realize, they are exceptionally, exceptionally low. Portugal is not politicized in Portugal. And even with Chega, as I can discuss in the last moments, we, I don't believe it will be. I'll tell you why next. OK, just show you the, the, the figures. It's available on the article on Journal of Market Studies. And basically, what we have on the left, the salience of immigration. Basically, it's the number of claims made by social groups about immigration that we found in the news. We, we analyzed Correio da Manhã and Publico for the period of since between 1995 and 2014. And um, it happened, and it's a random, well, I can explain the method left uh, later, but it's a random period. And on those days, what we find that is that Portugal there is less than a claim per day. And when we have more claims per on about immigration is between 2001 and 2004, that was that big, intense, the regularization program that led to an expected entrance of Ukrainians, Brazilians, Moldavians. And it was at this stage that immigration is most politicized because it's as well, before Chig existed, Paul Portas had the great idea in 2002 of making speeches through the electoral campaign saying, Portuguese jobs for Portuguese workers. And uh, this led to the clashes that we observed then during the government coalition between with PSD. And it was Durão Barroso who forced the PSDS to abandon this anti immigration rhetoric and to adopt the national paradigm of tolerance towards immigration. And it worked. Actually, Durão Barroso then comes up again on the fight against Nicolas Sarkozy on the European Commission. So he has some role on immigration. Looking from a comparative perspective, uh, what I can say is that these the, the dots are the mean on other countries. The other countries would be seven European countries like Germany, Ireland, UK, um, Spain, Belgium, Austria, and I might be missing one or two more. And what we see is that we are really, really, really exceptional in the sense that our salience and our polarization are always lower than the averages in their countries. This 1997, it's a really a statistic problem. We had no claims almost, but they were very polarized. And so we are end up here. But as you see, politicization of Portugal in, in of immigration in Portugal is incomparable to the in the in the European perspective. Conclusions. Before conclusions, let me just speak about the fourth wave of immigration that we are probably observing now. This fourth wave, I would say that it's much more diversified in terms of origins of immigrants because it's Brazil, India, and uh, other Southern Asian countries that we had no migration linkages before. Secondly, I think as well, like the Brazil in the third wave already was, it's it uh, diversify. It is not as much concentrated in terms in urban areas, and it uh, has expanded into the rural areas because there is this economic growth in the, the rural areas, and there is labor demand in the rural areas where there is no no laborers, no workers to be found, and therefore these immigrants are fulfilling this this demand that has been generated in the Portuguese rural areas due to the let's call the agriculture boom that is being observed in Portugal compared to the other three decades of decline. Uh, what, what else more? And this fourth wave of immigration, immigration is developing at the same time that immigration is, is taking place. So the dynamics, I think it will be very similar to the 2000s. But, but finishing this preliminary uh, Preliminary. Oh, what can I tell you? The conclusions. Portuguese exceptionalism. Ah, Portuguese was considered, some authors consider that Portugal is part of the Southern immigration, Southern Europe context. We are not distinctive from Spain, Italy, or Greece. I doubt. I doubt about this classification, as we've seen, and other colleagues have, have highlighted. To some, at certain point, Portuguese net migration is more similar to Eastern European countries than to Southern European countries, because we don't for a long period we don't attract immigrants at all because unemployment rates were too high, 
and the immigrants didn't see advantage to immigrating to Portugal. And those who were here, many of them left to their own to their own home countries. So I think Portugal is exceptional from Spain, Italy, and well, if we consider that immigration is a form of voting with one's feet, as Aristide Zolberg, an American author, suggested, then what I say is that the large Portuguese immigrant abroad, a community abroad, has voted against Portugal. And they don't seem comfortable in Portugal, therefore they vote with one's feet and they go abroad which it reflects the general discomfort with social with the present social and economic development in Portugal. At immigration, well, we, we are leaving the strict border control, but this was for a long time the paradigm. And to the EU authorities, we would impose strict border control at this course level, and then we would be coupled with intense, toler intense tolerance towards irregular inflows. And this is very much still a paradigm that, but we are leaving the strict border control. We still have intense border controls, but we are creating channels for legal migration that in the past couldn't, were not prevalent in the, the, at the political discourse. But then to finish, the politicization of immigration was exceptionally low until 2014. And let me remark one last thing, because I also studied the far right. I don't believe that Chega's interest into the parliament will change the politicization of immigration for one reason. That uh, first, Chega does not politicize immigration because they don't feel it resonates with public opinion. But Portuguese public opinion doesn't have a bad opinion about immigrants. In fact, as I have data about it, I uh, can say this with some confidence, many of the Chega members consider immigration to be good for the economy. So they have good perception of, of immigration being good to the economy. So it will be difficult to the political leadership to politicize immigration and to say they are really bad to the, the country. And when the, the Shaka members say, no, they are needed to the country because the, the, the economy will collapse. So I believe the, the odd group of Shaka will continue to be the gypsy community in Portugal, those who don't produce, who don't contribute to the economy, blah, 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 blah. While they cannot apply the same discourse into immigration. So my, my perspective for the future is that the politicization of immigration will continue to be low in Portugal for the future. Thank you for your time. I hope you st you're still with me. You didn't fall asleep.